Welcome everybody to Church Online. If this is your first time joining us, we are so glad that you're here. This morning, we're gonna sing a few songs together, we're gonna take communion together, and we're gonna hear a great message by our lead pastor. We would like to ask all of you though to take a moment and fill out a Connect card by clicking on the Connect button on the top right of your screen. We will also drop a link in the chat window. We would love a chance to get to know you and your story. We're a community here that is dedicated to helping everybody find and follow Jesus. My name is James and welcome to Lake Sawyer. Good morning, Lake Sawyer. Uh, so happy to see all of you. We decided this week to, uh, for worship time to take uh, it back a little bit, kind of strip it down a little bit. And uh, uh, so myself, uh, my name is Adrian, by the way, I'm one of the pastors here and we have a very special guest with us. Miss Celeste is here. Hi, Adrian. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing good. How are things? Oh, I feel like we shouldn't do anything else and um, we shouldn't sing until I ask you how you are doing. Thank you. That's really sweet. Because I'm another human. <laughs> you oh, probably haven't seen. This is the first time I've, I've seen realized many that, of us. actually. And we're six feet apart. Yeah. Yep. It's okay. Yep. We got out the, the yardstick and. We did. Yep. Measured. Yeah. Did we? No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so how are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm actually um, doing okay. Good days and bad days, mostly good. Yeah. Yeah. What are you guys taking away from this whole thing? Um, I've really appreciated the chance to get back to basics with the yeah. family, yeah. Um, cooking, sewing, doing all those things that I was taught to do as a child, but I um, got away from um, relationships are becoming more important. And I'm actually recognizing yeah. other human beings. That, it's funny you mentioned that on the street because I have to get out of their way. So I have to recognize them. That's so true. Acknowledge I didn't think about them. that. <laughs> like, like you're and before I was thinking, just, you know, head down. Yeah. Wow. Now I'm just, you know, respect the perimeter. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, how are you doing? Oh, we're we're, um, we're doing great. Family's doing great. You know, making the switch to homeschool has been interesting. Uh, we have two, na- two teenagers and a six-year-old, so the dynamic of that is always a challenge. And then you throw it in every day. Yeah. It's a it's it's a lot. Yeah. Um. But man, I I think we're gonna look back on this season and go. Amidst all this turmoil and pain that's been going on in our community with people passing, I even had a family member that was, it looked like they might have it. They thankfully didn't, but you just, your heart sinks for people Mm -hmm. as they're going through some really, really hard stuff as this, this illness just really zaps you. Um, The only thing I'm really suffering with is I have allergies for the first time in 12 years. We lived in, (laughs) we lived in Phoenix for 12 years, never had allergies. And then we move up to Washington and I have allergies my note is all dumped up. <laughs> so. Why am I laughing at <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry. It's all right. So we're going to sing this song, Graves in the Gardens. Love this tune. I think it's a great song. I like it too. Um, yeah. For us to be singing in this season because it talks about hope. And Definitely. Jesus gives us hope. So you ready to sing it? I'm ready. All right, here we go. I've searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough But you came along And put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied in your love Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you I'm not afraid Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. 
There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Here's my favorite part. Here we go. You give glory to ashes You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn mourning to dancing You give beauty for ashes You turn shame into glory Each week, we as a community take what is called communion. The night before Jesus went to the cross, he gathered with his disciples to have the Passover meal. And at that meal, they broke bread. And he said, this is going to symbolize the body that I'm going to give up for you and for us. He then took the cup after the meal was over and told us that it represented his blood that was freely poured out for all mankind. As a community of Jesus followers, we take communion to remember him as he instructed his disciples. If you haven't come to the point in your spiritual journey where you feel comfortable taking communion, please don't feel any pressure to do so. We're so happy that you are here and we're available for any questions you may have. Just press the live prayer button and a host will join you in a private chat window. For the rest of us, why don't you go grab some bread and some juice, and in the next minute or so, we can take communion wherever you are. During these unsettling and unprecedented times, Lake Sawyer is committed to coming alongside our community and helping those who are hurting or in need of assistance. Through your generosity, we've been able to do things like partner with Black Diamond Community Center, provide resources to local school programs, provide groceries for families who have lost their jobs, and provide financial relief assistance for those facing a greater need in this season. And we are so thankful for you who are faithful in your generosity. Maybe you're somebody that would like to become part of that. 
If you'd like to give, you can go through our website at lakesawyerchurch.org forward slash give. You can also do it on the Lake Sawyer app or you can send in a check by mail. We just want to thank you so much for your partnership. This weekend, we're going to be kicking off a brand new series we're calling Anxious for Nothing. And the series is based off Max Licato's book by the same title. The reality is this wasn't the, the sermon series that we intended to do post-Easter. But the truth is, nothing in this season is any way, shape, or form how we intended it to be or to go and as we look at where we are as people, as we look at where we are as a culture, the truth is anxiety is something that is impacting all of us. That was true of us as people before COVID-19. And in, in light of COVID-19 and everything that's been happening, anxiety levels have just been on the increase. Matter of fact, anxiety is the number one health issue that people experience, that women experience in their lives. And when it comes to men, anxiety is the number two health issue, only behind alcohol and drugs. And it's not because, it's not because men are less anxious. It's because we've allowed alcohol and drugs to be a coping mechanism instead of acknowledging or dealing with the anxiety that we experience in our lives. And it impacts generations as well differently. Like every generation is dealing with anxiety in different ways. They're, they're finding themselves anxious over different issues. I, I found this interesting. They said that the average teenager today is as anxious as someone who would be in a psychiatric ward in the 1950s. Like that just gives you an idea of how much anxiety has grown in people's lives. And so I started thinking, like, what are some of the realities? Like, what are some of the things, specifically with teens today, what are the things that they're dealing with? And matter of fact, Pew Research did a study on this. And what Pew wanted to know is, like, when it comes to teens, what are some of the issues in their lives that they deal with? Just all issues. Like, what are the things that, that teens see their peers dealing with? And I thought this was fascinating. This is what sort of Pew Research, this is what they found. That gangs was one of them. Roughly 71% of teens who were surveyed said, yeah, gangs is something that my peers deal with. Pregnancy was another one high up there. This is a reality for teens. Alcohol, 84% of teens said, like, look, alcohol usage, that's something that my peers deal with. Drugs, drug usage was up there, 86%. Poverty, poverty was something that was 87%. And I think even in light of some of the experience of this season, we'll see those statistics grow. But that was a reality for a lot of these kids. Bullying, almost 90% of kids. 90% of kids saying, look, like, this is what I see. This is what my peers are experiencing. Like, this is a thing. But the number one issue, the number one issue that teens, when surveyed, said that their peers are dealing with is this. Anxiety. That 96% of the kids surveyed said this is a reality. And it's not just their reality. It's our reality. It's everyone's reality. Anxiety is on the rise. As a people in culture today, we are seemingly less and less equipped to deal with anxiety. And the reality is that this is just in something for like the weak people. It's not like this is what the weak people have or, or literally like that, 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 some, that some people are, are more equipped or better or, you know, just have like built systems around their lives to help kind of navigate it. The, the truth is most of us are just kind of okay at ignoring it or burying some of the realities of the anxiety that we feel within. And so I started thinking, especially in light of like we're starting the series, like where, where, where does anxiety come from? Like wh what, is, what is the birth? What, 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 is, what does it grow out of? And there are really three things that I want to just quickly talk about. One is chemical. Like the truth is, 
that for some of us, we have a, a chemical sensitivity. There's a chemical imbalance in our, our lives that, that leads to things like depression, that leads to increased anxiety. That This is the reality for, for many of us. And the truth is, like, if this is something that you're dealing with, it's something that needs to be addressed. And that there are great people who are incredibly qualified to talk about some of the chemical imbalances, to help people who experience this find some normality in their lives and find some balance through medicine. And the truth is, I'm not that person. The truth is, like, in, they didn't teach us in seminary how to deal with and help people through chemical imbalances. But, but I wanted to talk about it because I want people to understand that this is part of the picture when it comes to anxiety. The next piece of that is circumstances or circumstantial things. Like things that happen in our lives can be large drivers of anxiety. Things that are in our control or even things beyond our control. We are in a season right now where many things beyond our control are directly impacting us. Things that are happening in our world are increasing levels of anxiety. And, and often what this comes out of or it's birthed out of is this absence of control. Like when we can't control the things that we think we should control, like our own health, Anxiety can rise from it. There's all sorts of circumstances. Circumstances in many ways that surprise us, that lead to anxiety. A, a few years ago, my family, we were uh, going on a hike uh, to a place called Morro Rock. And I want you to see a picture of it. This is a picture of Morro Rock. The, the, the end point of the hike is way up here at the top, the summit of the rock. And you can see pretty quickly, it kind of falls off to the floor. The elevation at the top of Morro Rock is, a, is just shy of 7,000 feet. So it's up there. It's, it's a great view. It's a great hike. This is actually a picture of us as a family at the top of Morro Rock. It's my wife and me and our kids. And you can see, like, you're, like, at, you know, the peak of these mountains, vast view around you. Like, it was an amazing place to be in. You can also see that here there's like these rails. And I have another picture here kind of zoomed out so you can see like this is the point out to the tip of Morro Rock. So when we take that picture, we're taking it out all the way where those people are. And so, you know, you're up there. You are a little bit protected because those rails are there. But, you know, if you slip, if you fall, if you just go over the rails, like impending death, like for sure. Like you're going down 7,000 feet, maybe 5,000 feet, whatever it is, you're going to fall, you're not going to live, it's not going to be good. So like immediately when I'm up there and I'm up there with my wife and I'm up there with my kids, I feel a little bit of anxiety, very surprisingly, kind of coming up out of nowhere. And it was that point that my oldest daughter, she said, hey, hey, can I, can I go run around? Because that's what kids want to do, right? Kids just want to go run around, have fun. And as she's asking that question, like literally in the process of her asking that question, I'm already forming my answer. And before she even finishes, I'm already saying no. Like, no, you can't go run around. No, that's crazy. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a good dad. I love you. I'm not going to let you go sacrifice your life. But the problem is, as I'm saying no, my wife is saying yes. Now, my wife is the more adventurous of us two. She's thinking, you know what? It's fine. How hard, you know, this is harmless. Nothing's going to happen. And of course, my daughter is going to take the answer that aligns with what she wants. It aligns with her desire. And so as soon as she hears my wife say yes, she begins taking off. And she's climbing on these rails. She's running back and forth, rail to rail. She's running up and down this, this whole area here. There's other people there. And I just can feel myself begin to lose it. Like I feel like my anxiety levels begin to rise. My, my palms begin to sweat. And even this week, as I was writing this story, the story down in my notes, even retelling this, my palms began to sweat. My, my heart began to race. And I found myself becoming very controlling, very protective. My daughter would run and I would, I would yell like, slow down, stop running. And she would climb up the rail and I would yell, get down off the rail. What are you doing? And she'd run across and, and she would like lay down and go under the rail. I'm like, what are you doing? I would just start yelling at her to the point where my wife pulled me aside and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm protecting our daughter. I care more about our daughter's life than you do. That's pretty obvious. Like, you don't seem to care if she dies or not. Like, I'm looking out for our daughter. Now, my wife is way too smart to, to take whatever just sort of stuff I say off, you know, whatever comes out of my mouth. Because she knows me. She knows the reality. And she can see, even before I can see it, the anxiety that is driving my actions. 
And she looks at me and she says, right now, you are ruining this moment for your daughter. And I didn't like it. I didn't receive it well in that moment. I, I was pretty huffy and quiet the rest of the way down from this hike. But she's right. My daughter was fine. She, there's rails there for a reason. But my anxiety, my anxiety because of the circumstances that I was experiencing had taken over. See, the truth is, like I said, I, I, I can't help you with the chemical piece. Odds are there's not really much I'm going to do with your circumstances. Those are just sometimes out of our control. Sometimes it's within our control, but decisions that you make. But the third piece, the third way that we can talk about anxiety, the third thing that kind of anxiety can come from, I can help you with, which is this, the spiritual piece. That is something I do believe I'm qualified to talk about. That's something I think I can shed light on to what Scripture has to say when it comes to dealing with anxiety. And so let's look at the Scriptures. You know, I read this statistic and I thought it was, was pretty interesting. It said, the most highlighted verse in the Bible. And I thought that was funny because, like, how do people know what the most highlighted verse is? Like, at first, I'm like, is someone, like, breaking into houses and going through Bibles to see what everyone's highlighting so we know what verses have been highlighted? Odds are they're probably using apps like YouVersion to figure out what people are highlighting. But they've concluded that this is the most highlighted verse of the Bible. And I think it's so fitting because it just illuminates the issue that we're talking about. It's actually the words of the Apostle Paul in a letter that he wrote to the church in Philippi. And this is what Paul writes beginning in Philippians chapter 4 in verse 5. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. Let's just actually jump back up to, to, to verse 5 and 6 there. Like, don't be anxious about anything. And I think, like, Christians hear these words, and they think, like, that, that is so powerful, and it's, like, it's so amazing, and it's such a great reminder. Yes, like, we shouldn't be anxious about anything. Like, we should turn to God in every season of life. We can go to him. And, and we do, and that's so true. But I think those who are tuning in, those of you who are tuning in who aren't followers of Jesus, like you hear a passage like this and you're like, that's crazy. Like really? Like are Christians really that naive? Like it, you might even say like, well, that's, that's literally why I can never be a Christian because they believe crazy stuff like this. Like who is this Paul guy? Like what does he even know? Like He's just writing this, this letter talking about not being anxious about anything. The dude must obviously be laying on a beach in Hawaii somewhere. Like that's, that's the kind of place you would be if you were, if you were talking about, hey, you know, don't, don't be anxious, don't worry, this is all good. Like he must be on like a permanent vacation. That's, that's the kind of place you would be to write something like this. The truth is, he wasn't on a beach in Hawaii he was in Rome, and you might be thinking, okay, well, like, Rome's cool. Like, I can, I can do Rome. Like, I want to go to Rome. Like, me too. I would love to go to Rome, right? But, but the thing is, he's not writing this letter, walking the streets of Rome. Paul is writing this letter to the church in Philippi from prison. He's writing this letter tied to a guard, recognizing that this is probably going to be the place where he lives out the rest of his life. And yet, even in the midst of those incredibly difficult and dire circumstances, Paul has the perspective to be able to say these words, that the Lord is near, that don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, continually turn to God. Like, that is fascinating to me. And maybe you think, maybe you think if you're tuning in again, you're not a Christian, maybe you think that's naive. But I would encourage you to explore this reality. Because the truth is, in the midst of the circumstances we face in life, nothing that we seemingly try leads to the peace that Paul is experiencing here himself. And so there's something that we can learn from Paul. There's something we can learn about God and the insights and the wisdom that he has to share with us about anxiety. Now, just a clarification point. Paul says here, don't be anxious 
for anything. Now, the word anxious there, in, in the Greek, it's, it's sort of this active tense, this, this, this ongoing anxiousness. What Paul is not saying is at any point in your life, it's not okay for you to have anxiousness. What Paul is saying is it's not okay for us as people to live in a continual state of anxiety. That's what we want to talk about. Again, to be anxious is to be human. All of us, we're going to have anxieties in life. But how do we get to a point where we don't find ourselves in a continual state of anxiety? I love the words of Max Licato. Max Licato would say it this way. He would say, the presence of anxiety is unavoidable, but the prison of anxiety, it's optional. Like, we're going to have anxiety in our life, but to be imprisoned by our anxiety is something that is optional. In the Old Testament, which is the first half of the Bible that tells us about the history of the people of Israel, we come across a king by the name of Jehoshaphat. And just to kind of give you a little understanding, the people of Israel, at this point in their existence, they had divided into two kingdoms, to the northern kingdom of Israel and then the southern kingdom of Judah. Jehoshaphat is the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. And as they divided, both of these kingdoms kind of took different you could went different directions. The northern kingdom often went in wayward directions. They pursued other things than God, than God himself. And many of them were led by ill-equipped or um, insufficient, misguided kings. The southern kingdom of Judah was a little bit different. As a people, they generally remained faithful. They were led by kings who, by and large, were faithful. Jehoshaphat was one of those kings who remained faithful. Now, it would be easy to think, well, it's easy to have perspective. It's easy to be faithful in a season of goodness, like a season where things are happening like you would want or hope or expect them to be. It's harder to be faithful. It's harder to maintain perspective when times are bad. And as we join with the story of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, what we experience is this is not a good season for the people of Judah. The reality is in this moment there are armies, there are three armies that are kind of approaching them from all sides. There's the Moabite army, the Ammonite army, and the Moonite army. The people of Judah, they see these armies who are marching in on them. They see these armies who are marching in on Jerusalem, and they go to Jehoshaphat with this report. This is what we read in 2 Chronicles, beginning in chapter 20. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. So these people come, they say, Jehoshaphat, like, there are these, this vast army, armies, there's three of them, they're coming for you, they're coming for us, they're coming to take over our way of life, to take our land. Like, we have to figure out what we're going to do with it. And so what I love about Jehoshaphat is when Jehoshaphat gets this report, he turns to God. He turns to him and he says, God, like, what do I do? Like, how do I manage the season? How do we get through it? And one of the things he feels really strongly is that not just him, but as an entire people, they need to turn to God together. And so he calls the people of Judah to fast. Now, this idea of fasting, specifically in Christian context, it's this understanding that in life that there's a natural part of us that we have this, this hungering, this longing for food that happens when we need food, right? And so often when you fast, what you're trying to do is when you have those moments, when you're having this, this hunger for food, instead of satisfying that desire with food, you turn to God. You spend time with God in prayer. And so Jehoshaphat calls himself and the nation of Judah to begin this practice, to start fasting, to spend time turning to God in prayer. And then we read these words beginning in verse 4. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. And I, and I love this as it's playing out because it's this great reminder that in the midst of difficult times, 
the midst of overwhelming circumstances, that we are to seek God, that we are to turn to God. But as chapter 20 continues to unfold, we see the posture of the people. We see the posture of Jehoshaphat as a king begin to shift, where he becomes less focused on God and more focused on the armies that are marching in. He's less concentrated on what God's doing and more controlled by the anxiety that is rising up in him. And we can see this, like I said, you can see it play out because he begins talking about the greatness of God and what God has done and how God has led the people of Israel through some very difficult moments and seasons and how God had been with them through those times. But yet he also begins to talk about all of the ways that God didn't do what the people thought that he should do. And this is what he says to him in verse, in verse 10. But now, this is what Joseph not talking to God. But now here are men from Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came up from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. Jehoshaphat says, look, God, when you brought us out of Egypt, we went by these people. You know, the, the, these people, the ones who are actually marching in on our territory, the one who are going to destroy us. Like, we had an opportunity to destroy them. We had an opportunity to take them down, and you didn't let us. You told us to steer clear of these people, and now they're coming for us. Like, this is on you, God. Like, this is, this is because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So, so what Jehoshaphat wants to know, because he realizes that if nothing happens, they're in trouble. He wants to know, what is God going to do with them? What is God going to do in this situation? So he asks God. This is what he asks God. He says, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power, no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. Like we have no hope to do anything. We do not know what to do. We don't. We're overwhelmed. But our eyes are on you. God, you're here. Anxiety is a part of what we're experiencing. But we want to know what is it that you're going to do in this moment. There's circumstances have ignited their anxiety. And what God decides to do is God decides to give a word to a young man named Jehaziel. And he asks Jehaziel to share this word with Jehoshaphat and his people. And this is what he shares in verse 15. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. And I love this word here. For the battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is not ours. The battle is God's. And the truth is, that's not something that we can declare once for all time. That is something that we have to remind ourselves and declare every single day. That in the midst of anxiety, in the midst of these struggles that we face, that the battle, it's not ours. That the battle is God's. And that we know even as we go forward, even as the battle wages around us, that God is near us. That he is with us. That he is faithful. And see, as this story played out, the very thing that Jehoshaphat feared the most, which was the annihilation of himself and his people, never actually happened. That God does what God so often does, that God provided victory for the people of Judah. God provided hope through their struggle and through their anxiety. And the reality is that's so true of us in our lives. For many of us, the things in our lives that we fear the most, the things that makes us the most anxious, these things, those realities, the circumstances, the things that drive our lives and drive our anxiety, those things rarely ever actually happen. 
Rarely do they ever come to fruition. Just like what Jehoshaphat feared the most, never did that actually come to fruition. The reality, the truth is, sometimes, sometimes things do happen. Sometimes what we do fear, it happens. And sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's almost more than we can bear. But yet, even in those moments, we know, we know that we are not alone, that God is with us, that God will see us through these seasons, that he's always faithful, that he never leaves our side, he will not forsake us, that he is our strength, he is our source, and he was the same strength and the same source for the Apostle Paul. And so that's why Paul, in the midst of his circumstances, in the midst of being in prison, chained to a guard, probably spending the rest of his life in that cell, it's why Paul could declare the same words that we started with from Philippians chapter 4. The Lord is near. Even in the worst of times, the Lord is near. That do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, the, 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 the peace, the peace that's promised, it is an everlasting peace. Because that peace is not the byproduct of a feeling. It's the byproduct of a commitment, of a choice, that we choose to lean into God because we recognize that God is near. And so like Judah, like Jehoshaphat, we seek him first, even when we look at the things before us, even when they seem unbearable or paralyzing. We know, we recognize as people that these aren't things that we can handle on our own. They're not ours to control to begin with. And so we choose to trust God. We choose to give over control to the one who's truly in control. God is near. And he's here for you. And he's here for me. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about very practical ways that we can keep our eyes affixed on him. Because the struggles of the world, the anxiety that we experience, these things are the things that pull our eyes away from the one who can see us through this. And so I'm going to invite you back next week as we start to talk more more, more specifically about how we can navigate seasons like this, knowing that God is before us. And as long as God is before us and our eyes are fixed on him, that nothing that we experience will ever stop us or fully overwhelm us. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the words of the Apostle Paul. And even if the world sees those words as foolishness, God, we know that there is hope and there is truth in those words. That even as the world, is, if, it's, if it's crumbling around us, God, that we don't need to be anxious because we know that with you by our side, that we can get through. And so I pray that as we, as we just kind of walk through this series together, as we recognize and wrestle with some of the own realities and anxieties in our lives, God, I pray that we would continually find ways and just to begin to loosen the grip and the control that we have on the things in our lives and slowly begin to hand them over to you. Knowing that until we're willing to let go, not of just our struggles, not of just our life, but of everything, Until we do that, we will never find freedom from the anxiety that lives ongoing that we wrestle with from within. And so we release this to your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
have thought by now they fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet still stand great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet come to pass my heart will sing your praise again Jesus you're still enough keep me within your love oh, my heart will sing your praise again promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness Still in your hands, this is my confidence. You never failed me yet. Mm -hmm. you, you never failed me yet. see you do it again you made a way when there was no way and I believe I'll see you do it again I've seen you move you move the mountains and I believe I see you do it again you made a way when there was no way and I believe I see you do it again. 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 Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness, I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness, I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. Never failed me yet. And you never failed me yet. And I never will forget. You never failed me yet. And I never will forget.
Thanks for the great message, Mike. We believe that church is more than a Sunday morning experience. It's people living life together and helping one another. One of the ways that we do that at Lake Sawyer is by being involved in a group. So how can you get started? Well, why not start with a short-term group? These are groups that meet online weekly for a limited period of time and explore a single relevant topic. We're really excited to be kicking off two new short-term groups for you in just a couple weeks. Now, those of us with kids, we could always use some helpful guidance in the parenting realm, couldn't we? And now more than ever. Well, Intentional Parenting is an 11-week parenting group that will meet Monday evenings beginning May 4th. In this group, you'll learn how to move from quick fix parenting to intentional parenting. We're also gonna be launching a seven week discipleship group called The Book of Titus that will meet Thursday evenings beginning May 7th. By examining Paul's training of his young apprentice Titus, you will gain critical tools to help you grow in faith and in your next steps in your journey in God's kingdom. For more details about these groups and to secure your spot, just click the button in the chat window or head to lakesawyerchurch.org slash groups after the service. Last week, we had our very first Zoom after party after our Easter services. It was so great to see so many of you join us after service to hang out, have a little bit of fun and chat a little bit. So we're gonna keep the party going every Sunday after service. Our host will drop a Zoom link into the chat window shortly. I hope you'll pop in and say hello. It's a great way to connect with the Lake Sawyer community and see both new and familiar faces. We hope you enjoyed the service today. We really look forward to seeing you next weekend.